One more time as you're seated, and, uh, and we'll jump in today. It's good to see everybody. Merry Christmas. Um, if you're from my homeland, and I'd like y'all, if it's 10 times fast, please. I do that every year. Merry Christmas. It's good to see you. Uh, we have, we have a, an incredible opportunity in this season to really celebrate Jesus and who he is. And, and uh, it's good to see you today. My wife and I just returned from a trip overseas, so I'm a little bit jet lagged. Uh, you would know that if you were talking to me in the front row, because I kept saying jet logged. I don't know what that means, but that's what I am today. But I love Jesus with all my heart. And today I want to do a message with you this morning called the hidden message, the hidden message. Um, now there's a couple of reasons why I call it the hidden message. I, I did a little preview of this on my social, but, but I've heard over the years this this idea of the hidden message. And I think that the reason why they call it a hidden message is because that we're celebrating today Christmas. And really the, the message of the Lamb of God, which is what I'm gonna, I'm gonna preach on you, the Lamb of God at Christmas, the idea of the Lamb of God is that the Lamb of God comes in at the end when he dies for our, our sins. But we're celebrating Jesus today and the, the birth. I also think that, that sometimes this message of the Lamb of God is, is hidden a little bit because... We like to celebrate, you know, the birth of Jesus. It's tidings of great joy, right? Not tidings of great, the Lamb of God shall be sacrificed for all of our sins. Sometimes it's a, it's a juxtaposing message, but, but really when you look at the message of Jesus and the birth of Jesus, you also have to recognize the, uh, the death of Jesus. And we're going to talk about the Lamb of God today. I'm going to read, I'm going to read from Matthew chapter one, and I'm going to start in about verse 19 and, um, this kind of will set the stage for us here for a few minutes. So Matthew chapter one, verse 19, because Joseph, her husband was faithful to the law. So Joseph, and of course, if you've been a part of the series, we've rehearsed this a little bit, but Joseph was betrothed uh, in their culture. That was almost equal to marriage. There were only a couple of differences. And he found out that his wife was pregnant. And because he was faithful to the law, he knew that he had to do something about that, probably divorce. But it goes on to say, and yet he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He loved his wife, his betrothed wife. Um, and so he was going to divorce her in secret so that she wouldn't be embarrassed. Verse 20. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, now for next year's message, I know I've mentioned this over the last two or three years, but I, I already have next year's message. And the reason is because I want to preach on, on, on the angel Gabriel, because he's everywhere in the story and he got the good jobs. You know what I mean? He got to do all the cool stuff. So next year I'm already preparing. It might change, but I hope not. I, I want to preach on Gabriel. He got to deliver all the messages. He got to be there at all the cool moments, right? So, but after uh, Joseph considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to make Mary or take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, and she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Can everyone say Jesus? Because he will save his people from their sins. And so in verse 21, you have both the birth of Jesus, and you have also the Lamb of God. You have the beginning of the story, and you have the ending of the story. And that's why I love the Matthew version. And so Jesus then is the Lamb of God. He will save us from all of our sins. Uh, I think that in some ways that the birth of Jesus is almost a little bit more, not important, but in the story in terms of doctrine and how things lay out, doctrine and theology, you kind of look at it and you would say that the, the birth of Jesus comes first, obviously, but there's a reason why. Um, this miracle set the stage for everything else that God would do in our lives. C.S. Lewis had a great perspective on what he called the Christmas miracle. Uh, C.S. Lewis called the, calls a miracle an interference with nature by a supernatural power. That's how C.S. Lewis viewed, viewed a miracle, and this is how he viewed Christmas. He called the birth of Jesus the grand miracle of Christianity 
because he saw every other miracle in scripture, in scripture as preparing for, demonstrating, or resulting from the incarnation. The birth of Jesus is the incarnation of Christ. That's where God comes down in the flesh, and he does the journey, and then we get forgiven for our sins. So everything else, including the crucifixion and the resurrection, comes from here. But today, I am going to treat both the birth and the death of Jesus as kind of an equal um, experience. So... Uh, one more time, how many of you love Jesus today? Do you love Christmas? Like how many true, true Christmas people do we have in the house today? Okay. How many of you started Christmas in February of last year? And I want a little bit of honesty. I, I got to tell you, I went into Costco a few months ago and uh, they were already putting out the Christmas, you know, decorations. And I, I got a little frustrated because I wasn't ready yet. You know, we have to get ready for Christmas around here. But he is the reason for the season. And uh, it's Christmas and it's Jesus 365 days a year for us. Um, and I'm excited for today. But what we have here is we have the story of Jesus. You shall call his name Jesus. The reason why it's the hidden message is not just because it's the beginning of the story and not just because there's other things that are more appropriate sometimes at, Christian, at Christmas. They call it the hidden message because there was something hidden before the birth of Jesus, and that was his name. In the Old Testament, Jesus was actually hidden. The name Jesus, who would he be, was actually concealed, and God didn't reveal that. So even though Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and in the Old Testament, Jesus was still there. Jesus was still in heaven at the creation. We understand that, but he was concealed. It wasn't, it wasn't known. So even though throughout the Old Testament, they would prophesy about what he would look like and what he would go through and, and all of the things that would have to align. And if you've studied this, you know that, that one of the great miracles of, of, of understanding Christ was there's no way that all those prophecies could have come to pass and had it not be Jesus. And we totally get there. We totally get that. But who Jesus was, was hidden in the Old Testament. Now, in doctrine and theology, we like that we have little phrases to help us remember things. And I've said this before, but in the Old Testament, who Jesus was, was concealed. But in the New Testament, he was revealed. And so when we talk about the name of Jesus, we're talking about the revelation of the Messiah, who he was. And as the name of Jesus was beginning to come clear, as it was penned by a star in the sky, what we have to remember that this name Jesus laid out over a 33-year-old life was the fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy that told, prophecy that told us that Jesus would have to go to the cross and die. Isaiah calls him the lamb that would be led to the slaughter and you shall call his name Jesus. And all of us have an Old Testament part of our life and we have a New Testament part of our life. All of us have a time before Christ and all of us, all of us have a time when he was revealed. And our entire journey uh, through our existence is God revealing who he is to us in little tiny ways. Before I was a Christian, God did things for me that I didn't even know he was doing. There were people praying for me that I didn't know were praying for me. And I honestly can look back over my life now and I can pen out my life in moments where I saw God beginning to work my, himself into me and draw me to him until the day on October 31st in 1989 on Halloween night. I don't know if there's something ironic about that for me, but on Halloween night, I bowed my knee to Jesus and he visited me and I found him. And we all have this kind of, a, of an experience. And so when they say his name shall be called Jesus, it's this moment of revelation. It's this moment of new life. It's this moment of supernatural intervention into your natural world, into your natural existence. It's the greatest miracle that could have ever taken place, and you shall call his name Jesus, Matthew chapter one. So a couple of thoughts here um, on the birth of Jesus. Number one, the birth of Jesus was no more a normal birth than the death of Jesus was a tragic accident. Neither of them were, were like, like accidental. Nothing was accidental. Everything is planned in heaven. Everything is planned. God says he knew you before you were in your mother's womb and all the days that you will live are numbered out for you even though you had not lived them. Everything is this grand plan of bringing your old and your new together at the moment of Jesus when he comes into your life. This is how God works. So when you look at the life of Jesus, sometimes like today we have to look at it as a whole. 
We look at the beginning and we look at the end and we see it as one simple strategic moment in history. So in my house, after 30 years of ministry, I have a lot of books. Now I realize that some people don't actually touch paper anymore and I, I totally get that and I'm praying for, for you. Um, but I still have paper at my house. Uh, I still write on a yellow pad. Come on, somebody. All my yellow pad people need to represent because I, kids make fun of me all the time. I'm just, I'm just telling you. Uh, but that's how I am. So I have books. And, and what I've started to do is take my books. I've, well, I've started to give them away. Um, uh, but I take my books and I'm in my office. I'm taking subjects now. And I ordered off of Amazon some really cheap metal bookends. You know what I mean? Like people spend a lot of money on bookends and they never work. You know what the best ones are? The cheap little metal ones. They're like, they're like $4 a pair. So I just bought a bunch. And I'm taking subjects and I put a bookend on this side. And I have all my books on one subject. And I put another bookend at the other side. And so when I look at my bookshelf now, I know that there's one entire subject from beginning to end. From beginning to end, I see marriage, I see youth ministry, I see devotions, I see small groups, whatever it is, I see from beginning to end. And this is how God wants us to view his walk on earth. That it, there was a beginning and there was an end. At the beginning, he was born, and at the end of his journey in 33 years, he died on the cross and went to heaven. It's complete. He also wants you to know that because there's a beginning and an ending, and we can see it as a whole, that when you look at the tragedy of Jesus, the, 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 the passion of the Christ, and you see what Jesus went through, that on his worst day, when they were pressing, they were pressing the crown of thorns into his head. And just, just last week, um, I was overseas. We were actually with my, my wife's family in Uganda. We have churches there and family there. So we went for a big celebration, 35-year service at the main church. But as we were driving, Driving, they actually have the trees there that made that they made the thorns uh, that were was made that they made the crown out of to put on Jesus's head. We actually have a version of them here in Colorado. They've gone all over the world, but the spikes on this plant are this long. And they just look the mo like the most painful thing that you could ever see. So while Jesus was having the crown of thorns shoved under his brow and there was blood pouring down his face, he wasn't caught up in the moment. He was caught up on the subject of your life. He was caught up on the salvation and the love and the grace of the people that he came to die for. So that should tell us that whether we're having a good day or a bad day. See, Jesus, when he looks at you, he doesn't see you on one day and go, oh my gosh, I hope they make it through today. You know what I mean? He doesn't look at you if you're having an argument with your spouse and like take bets with Moses and Elijah whether or not it's going to turn out okay. Moses, what do you think? I don't know. I don't know. Third one this week. What God does is he sees your life from beginning to end and he wants us to know that he's with us every single day all the way through. He sees your life as bookends. I saw you here. I saw you on your best days and your worst days. I saw you with your best attitude and your worst attitude. I saw you on the days you had no money and I saw you on the days where you had great victories. I saw you when you were excited and discouraged and God doesn't want you to look at your life as a day. He wants you to look at your life as a bookend of time that we get to experience the love of Jesus and understand salvation, which is what gives us the open door to go to heaven and spend eternity with him. But it's symbolic. This, this thing is symbolic for our lives. So he doesn't just see us in one single event. He sees us along the way. Number two, the entire life of Jesus was part of God's um, plan, his intentional plan. Everything that God does that he did, he did with intention. There was not an accident. There was no like, there was no like roll the dice with you. No part of his life on earth was a one-off. No more than any part of your life is a one-off. Everything has purpose in God's world. The incarnation into you, your Old Testament, your New Testament, his incarnation into you, like he comes into your life. How many of you are just glad today when you look over this last year that God was with you, you know, through all the good times and the bad times? Um, and and it's, it's one of those things where I think that the longer you go in life, the more you appreciate it. But we, we tend to see God through the eyes of where we're at in the moment. And we forget that it is a part of a bigger plan with bookends, right? So I come from the West Coast. My family's there, or over the years they've been there. There's not many left now, but I, uh, 
I've made that drive a lot of times. And you know, when I was younger, I was like some of you. The greatest challenge was, I'm gonna drive without stopping. You know what I mean? When you're in your 30s, you're like, bro, you know, I got this. I'm not gonna stop, I'm not gonna drink, I'm not gonna eat, I'm not gonna do nothing. And it's like, you think you're gonna get a medal at the end of your drive, right? And all you get is a few days of anxiety and no sleep and worthlessness. So, um, but I made that drive a few times, right? And when you're driving across to the West Coast or coming from the West Coast here and you hit Colorado, come on somebody, how many of you know Colorado is one of the most beautiful places in the world? I mean, let's just, let's just so all of you who just moved here, some of you just moved here, here, I know that, and you're wondering if you're going to like it, I just want to make an announcement to you. You're going to like it every single day a little better than you did yesterday. It's a great place to live. And when you're driving here and you go through the canyons of Colorado and you see the Rocky Mountains, you know, and you're not used to that terrain, it's, it's phenomenal. You're going through the canyons, you've got the Colorado River on the right, and it's just, it's beautiful. And the rocks go up into the sky. You're like, this is the most beautiful thing. But somewhere along the line, depending on what freeway you have to take, you have to go through Utah. <laughs> now, if you're from Utah, remember, this is a church and forgiveness is paramount. And so offense is not really something that we, but I'm just telling you, somewhere along the line, you got to go through Utah. And if you want to drive straight through, you have to drive through the night through the desert of Utah, and somewhere along the line when nothing changes for hours, you see nothing, you see nobody, you want to go to sleep, you want to drift off into heaven, and you will drive for hours asking yourself this question, when will this end? Now, I know there's some beautiful things there, but I'm just saying that there are parts of the drive that are not so exciting, right? So along the line, when we realize that God has a plan and we're not viewing our life in a moment, we're viewing it from a birth and, and we've got our, our departure into heaven and in between, God wants to reveal himself. He wants to incarnate himself into every day so that we understand that our worst days are also the prerequisite to our best days. And in God, you don't learn anything without going through something. And that version of Christianity that tells us that all Christians should never go through anything, those people are about to go through something. Come on, somebody. And so there's, there's something about this walk. Even Jesus, even grace had a cross. Come on. Somebody say amen. Like you have to know that your life here is going to have some good days, bad days, but there's a plan to it. God uses everything. And it's so Christianese to say that God uses everything, but God really does use everything if you're involved and distracted with his purposes. See, without understanding the purpose of God, you will never understand why it is that God allows us to go through things. Because the Bible says that his power is perfected in our suffering. It doesn't say that his power is perfected in our perfection. It says that his power is perfected by us understanding how to juxtapose our good days and our bad days, our Colorado mountains and our Utah deserts, but we have to get from point A to point B. And somewhere along the line, we're going to discover who Jesus is, not because we don't need him, but because we do need him. You see, this is how it works. There's this incredible version of how God has an intentional plan to reveal himself. Next, we understand this. That his life began being carried and rescued as an infant. So if you've read the Matthew version, it's incredible. Jesus is being carried. He's being rescued. Of course, the, the cool angels like to show up, you know. People start trying to hide him. They're trying to take him places and put him places. And every time that the enemy tries to come along and find Jesus and kill Jesus, they're all, God's already one step ahead of the enemy's plan. And it ends with rescuing us as he carries our sins to the cross. So his life begins by being carried and rescued as an infant to rescuing us and carrying our sins to the cross. And there's two things that we should take from this. Number one, you need to know that when you do have an attack of the enemy, now we are those people that through scripture, biblical doctrine, biblical scriptural evidence and understanding, we do believe that there is an enemy. We believe that there is an enemy. But can I tell you that as long as we're close to Jesus, Jesus will carry you. He's always one step ahead of the enemy in your life. Number one, he's always ahead. He's always ahead of the enemy. But number two, that at the end, Jesus also defeats the final enemy, which is death. And we get to spend eternity with him. So we have Jesus being carried and, and uh, being rescued as an infant, which is symbolic to how he carries us and rescues us and takes us to heaven. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture of how God works. Um, 
the first miracle of Jesus being rescued is proof of the second miracle of us being rescued. So I don't know, many of you have probably studied this because you know science, it's, it's been all through science journals and people have talked about it in the church. But I was reminded of the, the oldest seeds that have ever been discovered and then planted. So um, there was a, a place called Masada, Masad or Masada, and it was a fortress that was built by Herod um, over 2,000 years ago during the time of Jesus. And the first seeds, the oldest seeds in the world that have ever been found were from Masad in the ruins. They are the oldest seeds to ever be planted and germinate. It was a palm seed and germinate. So for the scientists who found the seeds, the first crazy thought that they had, the first miraculous thought, if we plant this seed, uh, will it germinate and sprout after 2,000 years? Because then the second miracle was obvious because if it plants, if they plant it and they water it and it sprouts, it also will produce seed and give new life. And so for us, when we look at the first miracle of Jesus, if God gave him, rescued him, it was miraculous and angels were involved, we also have to believe that at the other end of the bookshelf, there is new life and there is something in us that God wants to do in the future. So then the first miracle is actually evidence of the second miracle. We need to remember that if God's working in your life, he also has a plan and his miracle intervention, his millennial intervention into you is also proof that he's going to finish what he said that he was going to finish. Now, um, next, I'll, I'll kind of begin to wrap this up here, but it took him 33 years to walk into Jerusalem with no detours, no distractions, and no turning back. And there he gave his life on the cross so 33 years. So from the time that he was born all the way until the time that he was resurrected, Jesus was going somewhere. He, he's always going somewhere. He's always doing something. God was never bored. We get bored. There's a, um, there's a philosopher and a theologian from some time ago, his name was Kierkegaard. He was, the, he was the one who actually wrote the first definition for boredom. Kierkegaard looked around in his generation and he was watching young adults who were beginning to just kind of waste their life with no purpose. The, he watched them and he sat down and he began to pen this, this, this definition. The very first definition for boredom didn't sound like what you would find in the dictionary or dictionary.com dictionary today. It's not like having nothing to do, right? The first definition for boredom is this. Having no, revealed, re, having no revelation of God's purpose for your life. Did you know that's the very first definition for boredom? Because God is never bored. He, he was born and for 33 years he was on target. He was born and for 33 years he was on a mission. He was born, and whether he was being persecuted, lied about, whether people were trying to stab him in the back, whether Judas was, was turning his back on him, whether he was laying hands and miracles are happening, it didn't matter what the day looked like. He was born, and he was on a mission from God, right? He was never bored. And so therefore, in our lives, when God incarnates into us, then we realize that we have a beginning, and that we have an end, and that the first enemy couldn't take us out. The last enemy, death, has already been defeated, and we're going to live a life close to Jesus, we realize that, no, he does have a purpose for our life. Like, there are some things that we're supposed to do while we're here. There are some things that we're supposed to experience while we're here. And we, you know, I preached this a few weeks ago, I think, but like that whole thing in church, you hear a lot of words that we hear all the time, words like destiny and words like purpose, you know, and if you're young, you're going to hear the word generation like two million times before you're 21 years old. Your generation, your generation. But the truth is he does have a purpose and he has a destiny and he has an inheritance. See, we talk, we talk about destiny as if it's something we're supposed to do now. Our destiny is at the other end of the bookend. It's in heaven. Our purpose and our inheritance is what we experience here. 
See, what we forget is that yes, we're going to heaven, but God has something for you now. We're not just sitting around, wasting our time, wasting oxygen on the planet so that someday we could just go be with Jesus having had no purpose. God does nothing without a purpose. He didn't come here with no purpose. He didn't die without a purpose. He didn't save you for no purpose, and he doesn't want you to live without a purpose. There's some things that we get to do and we get to experience while we're here. And when you look at the life of Jesus on the day that he was born, we have to remember as we look at him holistically from beginning to end, from the moment that that little baby, that first cry of Jesus, that first breath when he cried out, that crack in heaven. Remember, there had been 400 years of silence from God. And that silence was broken by the cry of a baby. And in those 400 years, God was working in the world and creating the Roman roads so that the gospel could walk on the roads and putting governments in place and putting disciples in place and putting it all together for 400 years until that very incredible moment when that first cry of baby Jesus came. He cried out and it was the end of what it was in the old. It was the beginning of the new. But what we have to remember as wonderful as Christmas is Jesus was born to die in our place. God wasn't just giving us a savior, he was providing for us a lamb that could take all the sins of the world upon himself so that we could bookend our life and go to heaven and live with purpose today. And so here's where we are when we look at Christmas. I think sometimes, sometimes, and I've tried to evaluate this, I've tried to think, think this through a little bit, but Maybe sometimes we lose the meaning of Christmas because we forget the goal of the birth. The goal of the birth was not just for us to give gifts to each other. The goal of the birth was not just to have you know, glad tidings of great joy and preach from Luke. The goal of the birth was eternal life. The goal of the birth was so that you and I could know Jesus personally. The goal of the, of the birth was that, that God had a plan we get to be a part of it. And so we have to remember that when Isaiah said that he would be a lamb to the slaughter, that's not a bad thing. I view that as the most beautiful, most incredible saga, story, narrative in human existence that God would foresee our lives and every detail of it and that we could know him and that we could experience him. And I believe that C.S. Lewis was correct. I believe that he was the incarnated God in the flesh who came to love us and help us and all of the other pieces of our Christian walk and our Christian life and our Christian beliefs and our, our theologies and our doctrines and all the things that we love to debate Okay, so, and I, here's another thing too. Like, I, Christmas time is not a time to debate. You know what I mean? Like, there's, Christians are so famous for debating things that don't really matter in the course of eternity. You know what I mean? Imagine if we spent all the time that we debate with each other and attack each other in the big C kind of Christian. Imagine if we just gave all that time to loving people and helping people and helping people find Jesus and serving the community and just quit debating. There's some things and sometimes some moments where we have to recognize that we are all brought together by the birth of Jesus, which led to the Lamb of God who carried all of our sins. And, uh, and that's why we have a future in Jesus. Come on, somebody. Do you love him? Okay. So let's pray. Let's pray today. Let's have a, let's have a, a moment where we recognize the beginning and the end, or we recognize the old and the new. And right here today, in this moment, whether I know you, don't know you, whether you're visiting, not visiting, I believe that God's here for you right now. Stand to your feet. I'm going to close in prayer. And, uh, and then we're off for the rest of our week of Christmas festivities. Remember, next week, next week, no morning services. We have a four o'clock service because it's Christmas Eve. And also, I do want to say something. I want to thank all of you who, who gave and are still giving to the Christmas gifts. But we gave... We gave 200 ki kids, they got all their Christmas kids, gifts from us, right? So it, they got everything. We took care of 200, 200 children, all their Christmas gifts. And you know, we forget the, we just kind of forget you know, some of the things. We don't, we're not, we just want to be reminded as much as possible of, of what the congregation has done. And, 
And then today, yes, and today, there is a, there's a big band concert today. Come on, Over the Hill Band. My father-in-law plays the trumpet in this band. Usually gets a solo out of it because I think they use our building. But he's also good. If you want to hear some good music today, three o'clock, come on in. I know people do it every year and they celebrate, they, they sing and they play. It's a community band, very well known, a good time. Come back at three o'clock. Okay, let's close this up with a prayer. Bow your heads with me. Okay, bow your heads with me today. <clears throat> Keep them bowed just for a moment. Just for a second, eyes closed, heads bowed, because every single one of us in the course of time finds ourselves in between. What was hidden doesn't want to remain hidden, but wants to be revealed in your life. Jesus is the revealed Savior. Jesus is the one who created you, and he loves you. Jesus is the one who's been working inside of you since the day that you were born. He knew your name. Today, I want to pray for you. In the spirit of just like normalcy, just list authenticity. If you're here this morning and you need to know Jesus in this way, like you need to know that he is here for you, that he came for you, and he's in your in-between. When I count the three, I want you to lift your hand quickly so I can see you. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm just going to pray for you, pray for us, and then we're out of here. But if you need him and you want to know him at a deeper level, please just slip your hand up quickly. One, two, three. If that's you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hands all over the room. Thank you, thank you. All the way across. Jesus, I love you today. And we're so grateful because we know who you are, we know why you came, and we know what you did. And today I pray for all of those, maybe 20, 25 people who lifted their hand. I pray, Father, that you would draw near to them and that you would open up your life to them, that you would reveal yourself to them because their hearts are open to you. I pray, Lord, that this next season, maybe starting right now, this would be that moment where the cry of baby Jesus cracks open the heaven and divides time for their life. I pray, Father, that you would bless them and strengthen them and that they would know you at a level they've never known you before. I pray, Lord, that you would love them care for them, that you would shape them, that you would heal them, that you would get inside their thoughts and their hearts and their mind and give them confidence that you have known them through the whole journey. And I love you, Father, for how you heal people and how you love people. So church, pray this with some gusto today. Pray this out loud for everybody that's here and online. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for all you've done in me. And today, this is my in-between. This is my moment. Jesus, be born in me. Come into my life. Thank you, Father, for forgiving me of all my messes, all my mistakes, all my sin. Jesus, I give you all the glory in your precious name. Say this out loud. Say, Lord Jesus, I receive you into my life today. Amen. Come on, put your hands together for Jesus. Let's sing.